do you become a professional historian? How long does it take? And if you go the academia route, what's it like to work in a university? That's the topic of today's podcast from History Calling. Before I begin though, I should issue a quick disclaimer, which is that everything that follows is my own opinion and or experience, so of course other people may disagree or have a different experience. I'll also be talking about the UK education system, as that's what I went through and eventually worked in, so my experiences will not match those of people in other countries, and there might be some slight variation between institutions too. It might also be worth noting at this point that this is different in the Republic of Ireland, as I think this confuses people sometimes. I'm from Northern Ireland, which is in the UK, and having never lived in the Republic, I have virtually no experience of the Irish education system beyond having given some conference papers at Irish universities, so I won't be talking about that. Okay, let's dig in. The road to becoming a professional historian starts, as you might imagine, with lots of time spent in school, where you will need to remain until the bitter end, meaning you'll be there until you're 18. In England, Wales and Northern Ireland, you do qualifications called A-levels, which determine whether you get into university. Most people will do three or four of these, and it would be a good idea if history was one of them, though you can often get onto history courses with A-levels in other humanities subjects like English. In Scotland, they do hires, then advanced hires at the end of school, and I'll be honest, I don't know any more about it than that, having not gone through the Scottish system. If you went to school in Scotland, though, please feel free to explain their secondary education system more fully in the comments below. After your A-levels or hires, it's off to university. Even for someone who's going to end up being a professional historian, I wouldn't say you have to do an undergraduate degree in single honours history if you don't want to, but it would make life easier if you did either history, joint honours history with another subject, major minor honours where the major is in history, or at the very least a humanities subject so that you get experience of essay writing and analytical thinking. An undergrad degree typically takes three years, though if you do something called a foundation year, which tends to be for people who don't have the necessary A-level or hires qualifications, or you go to a Scottish university, then it's four. On lots of Scottish courses, you then get a Scottish master's, but just to be clear, that's actually an undergraduate degree. A good example of people who have such a qualification are the current Prince and Princess of Wales, who studied at St Andrews. Okay, so assuming you didn't go to Scotland and you haven't taken any gap years, you're now 21 years old and in possession of a shiny new degree and some nice letters after your name. Mine are BA Ons, if you're interested, with the BA meaning Bachelor of Arts and the Ons meaning it's an honours degree. I don't know what you'd need to do to not get an honours degree though, because it just never came up. Now, you almost certainly need a master's degree. I've literally only ever met one person who went from undergrad to PhD without a master's in between, so just assume that you'll need one. At this point, most people who are going to become professional historians will do history, even if their undergrad wasn't in that subject. It's comparatively rare to meet someone who went on to do a history PhD, but who did something else at MA level, unless maybe they did an MA in something like historical literature that was awarded by an English department, but was clearly still very history heavy. These courses can be taught or research based, and in my experience, they last one calendar year, September to September. So you're now 22 and have more letters after your name, probably MA short for Master of Arts. Now for the big step. If you want to become a professional historian, you're going to need a doctorate, and that's going to take over three years. You might be able to get funding for this, or you might have to pay for it yourself. I handed in my PhD thesis two weeks shy of the third anniversary of matriculating for my PhD course, and there were plenty of people who studied with me who took a fourth year before they submitted, which was completely acceptable as long as you can pay for it. Once you submit, you have to have a viva. This is a type of exam where you have an external examiner from another institution and an internal examiner from your own. They will be experts in your field and will basically sit for a couple of hours and grill you on your thesis, making you defend it. It takes a couple of months to get a viva organised after you submit because you have to give your examiners time to read your thesis. They'll have been selected and lined up for you ahead of your submission, by the way, by your primary supervisor. If your viva goes well, you might only have minor corrections, like typos. 
Then there's minor amendments, a bit more to do, but still only an extra few months. Major amendments, more like six months extra work, or you might have to revise and resubmit. This is a bigger deal because you'll probably have to go away for another year and seriously rework the thesis before having another viva. But it's actually not that uncommon in my experience and don't panic if it happens to you. The terminology I've just used here, like minor amendments and revise and resubmit, will vary from institution to institution, but they're all following pretty much the same framework. If you still don't get the PhD at the end of your second viva, you might be offered a lower qualification like an MPhil, which is a Master of Philosophy. Personally, I had minor amendments and having had my viva in late November, I made those amendments, submitted them in March and graduated in the next graduation cycle, which was in July. This was nearly four years after I'd started the PhD course. If you don't take any breaks in your entire educational career from the time you start school, which is four or five in the UK, until you have that PhD certificate in your hand, you will be 26 at the end of it. I did have a year out in between my MA and PhD, so I was 27. Congratulations. After almost 22 years in full-time education, you've now made it to the bottom rung of the academic ladder. Yes, that's right, the bottom rung. Now, I'm going to pause for a moment to say something which might seem just a touch controversial. I know there are some YouTubers and writers out there touting their BA and even MA in history as though that's all you need to be considered a professional. But while I respect the work that went into those qualifications, I have them myself remember, so I'm hardly going to rag on BAs and MAs, and I applaud and fully encourage their enthusiasm for this subject, I'm afraid that they aren't professionals. In fact, they're barely halfway there, even if they have the master's degree. If you don't believe me, take a look at the website jobs.ac.uk and select the option for history jobs. It's the main website advertising university posts and PhDs in the UK and usually has the available Irish posts as well. Plenty of North American, Australian and European posts are on there too. What you will see is that it's virtually unheard of for anyone advertising an academic job to be willing to accept an application from someone who doesn't have a PhD. Once in a blue moon, you might see a short-term, lowly research assistant post where they say they'll accept people with MAs, but frankly, the academic job market is so tough that lots of people with PhDs will apply for those posts too, and unless there's some serious institutional nepotism going on, like your MA dissertation supervisor is hiring you and they're only advertising the post because they're legally obliged to, you haven't got a chance. Without a PhD, you also just don't have the necessary training to conduct proper research that can withstand scrutiny. Again, I think this is why a lot, but not all, work which is put out by people without the extra doctoral training is of such poor quality, and often plagiarised, meaning stolen. You may have noticed how many substandard channels run by people too dumb and lazy to do the work themselves steal my content, for instance. I sure have. These people have never gone through any kind of peer review of the type you'll get at Aviva, or through routinely presenting your work at conferences, which you'll start doing during your PhD where experts in the field won't indulge claptrap copied from Wikipedia and will call you out on your rubbish and demand better of you. You'll be expected to show your primary source research and you won't be able to rely on just stealing and regurgitating other people's work. You're expected to make an original contribution to scholarship. There is the odd example of someone who didn't do a PhD, is a self-taught researcher and writer and is really good at it, but they are the exception that proves the rule. One example would be Lady Antonia Fraser, a very well-respected historical biographer who, as far as I can tell, didn't do a PhD in history, but whose work is very good and always well-researched, written and referenced. So I'm not saying that anyone without a PhD is rubbish, but there are only going to be a small number of people like Lady Antonia in the world. Assuming you've got the PhD though, and you want to work in the university sector, what next? While you were doing that PhD, your institution should have ensured that they gave you some teaching practice by having you teach the undergrads and maybe even the MA students. This is called being a TA, a teaching assistant. It's sometimes also called being a tutor, they're basically the same thing. 
It is very bad form if they don't do this and I've heard of universities that don't because you're going to need to talk about your teaching experience to get any job that entails teaching. And again, it's virtually unheard of to hire someone who doesn't have it. If your university didn't provide it, you're at a serious disadvantage compared to others on the job market and might need to consider a separate teaching qualification to plug this hole in your CV. For this TA work, you can expect to get paid what will feel like sweatshop earnings whilst working your butt off, class planning, teaching, answering emails and marking an insane number of essays and other submissions often written in practically incomprehensible English even though the students in question will speak this as their first language and most will not have something like dyslexia. The general dumbing down of the primary and secondary education systems, which is producing such huge quantities of semi-illiterate adults who don't know how to spell or use capital letters and full stops, is a whole other topic. You'll also be doing your own research and trying to fit in conferences. I was even organising a conference one semester I was teaching and I don't know how I survived. It was seven day weeks, non-stop, the whole time. Good preparation for YouTube actually. I believe it was during that semester that I sat down and worked out how many hours I was doing as a TA and what that meant my hourly rate was. And gang, it was less than the minimum wage for a 16 year old dropout. And bear in mind that I had a BA and an MA at that point and was halfway through a PhD. I wasn't paid for organizing the conference either, even though I was volunteered for the job. Instead, you're doing it all for the good of your CV. Again, I hope you can see why I roll my eyes at people who stopped at BA or MA level but want to be treated like they're fully fledged historians. They have no idea of the work and sacrifice it takes to get there. Imagine a person seeking employment in another field and wanting to be taken seriously as a professional without having done the proper training. Would you want to go to a doctor, lawyer, accountant, dentist or any other number of professionals who only did half the necessary schooling? I doubt it, and if you do knowingly do this, then you've only got yourself to blame when they do shoddy work for you. Unfortunately, history is one of those subjects that people seem to feel they can parachute into and immediately be good at, and that they instantly deserve to be taken as seriously as all the people who spent 22 years doing the necessary work. This is why I wish people without the training, or who haven't proven their worth through publishing great books like Antonia Fraser's, would be referred to as amateur historians instead of just historians. I don't believe it's legal to call yourself a medical doctor or a lawyer if you've only done partial training for it, and I don't appreciate my field being cheapened by letting anyone who feels like it say they're an historian. No, you're not. I know that opinion won't sit well with some people, but before you start complaining at me, I urge you to think of whatever your job is and the knowledge or skill set you had to build to get it, or which you will have to build to progress in it. And I very much include trades and jobs here which you don't need to go to university for because tertiary education simply isn't necessary for many things and I actually think too high a premium is put on it sometimes. There are plenty of other routes to excellent careers. Now ask yourself, how would it feel if someone else was just allowed to skip ahead up the career ladder in your chosen field without earning it and prance around as though they're as qualified as you, someone who actually put the work in? Anyway, with that little sidebar done, back to the academic career ladder. A few lucky people, they might have magical powers actually, will manage to get research grants after university, allowing them to continue working on their own interests for another year or two and publish. Hardly anyone gets these though, so don't hold your breath. Another job you might be able to get is as a researcher on someone else's project or a teaching fellow. I got a little three month part time post as a research assistant at my home institution, for instance, which I did just before and after my Viva. You will see proper full time research posts advertised, though, usually as research assistants, research associates or research fellows, with each being better than the last, even if only on paper. These can last a few months or up to four or five years. It just depends on how long the project is funded for. A teaching fellowship is on the same rung as these, but is usually between nine months and two years long. You'll also have to move to wherever the job happens to be, so if you have a family, you're going to find this very challenging. I've met multiple people who lived in one country in the UK and flew to work once a week in another, squashing all their face-to-face -face interactions with students into just a couple of days and then working from home the rest of the week. 
Being a teaching fellow is in some ways like being a TA, but full time and for somewhat better money, though I'll bet your hourly rate if you break it down would still stink, just hopefully not as much. During this time, you will live and breathe teaching. You will have nightmares about it. It will consume your world. You'll have a high workload teaching on lots of big undergraduate survey courses with hundreds of students and almost no time to do your own research, even though you're expected to publish in peer-reviewed outlets in order to progress up the career ladder. You will almost certainly be doing well over 40 hours a week, no matter what your contract says, and working even while you're on your annual leave. You will be faced with what might seem to you to be a surprising number of students with learning disabilities and or psychiatric problems, sometimes very severe psychiatric problems, none of which you will have been trained to deal with because you're an historian, not an educational psychologist, a psychiatrist or a counsellor. If, God forbid, one of these students harms themselves or feels that they didn't get the grade they deserved, you may find yourself blamed for it, even if they simply didn't earn the grade they wanted, or if the law of the land says that you're not allowed to ring up their next of kin and, without the student's permission, share your concerns about the medical well-being of an adult, which is what the students are, remember. I didn't actually ever work as a teaching fellow, but I did an interview for one once, and even the amount of effort that required was insane. As well as regular interview prep, which included a 10-minute presentation with accompanying PowerPoint, I had to plan a three-hour tutorial ahead of time for which I had to read an entire Machiavelli play. I then got asked one question about it on the day. Despite the drawbacks, however, I am still of the opinion that getting a teaching fellowship is a good route to becoming a lecturer because you get that extra teaching experience, plus probably the chance to run modules, supervise final year dissertations, second mark, moderate modules and be a personal tutor. You likely won't get any of that as a TA. I ended up going the researcher route, not out of any particular preference, but just because that's the job I was able to get and you can't afford to be picky. Again, you'll have to move to wherever this job is. This post came with no career development built into it. When you're a researcher, you're the hired help on someone else's project. However, my boss was kind enough to get me a little bit of teaching, which I was then able to put on my CV. As I'd already published a book and a journal article in between graduating and getting this job and got another article out while I was in post, again only because my boss let me take a little bit of time off from my actual job to write it up, which he didn't have to do, I eventually managed to get a short-term lecturing job lasting less than a year. These, by the way, come with much the same challenges as the teaching fellowship posts, but the money might be a bit better and you might have a bit more time for your own research, at least in theory. It also looks better on your CV. By the by, it's just occurring to me as I'm reading this out, I'm not even touching on what it takes to get something researched, written up and published, but just for an example, under normal circumstances, a single 10,000 word journal article might take a year of your life, from having the idea, to getting to the archives in between doing all your other work, to writing it up, to getting it beta read, to then submitting it to wherever it is you want to have it published, waiting three months to hear back from them. They might come back and say, oh, well, we might take it, we might not. It would need all of these alterations done to it if we're going to take it. You make all the alterations, you submit it again. At that point, if they accept it, then you can say, okay, it's in train, it's going to be published but it could be anything up to another year before it actually appears. So just the whole publication route is absolutely hellish sometimes. Um, I don't have time to get into it any further here, but I just wanted to throw out there that all that will be going on in the background at the same time you're doing all the other stuff that I'm talking about in this video. Getting the lecturing post I acquired only came after doing an unmentionable number of job applications something which will take up a freakish amount of your time if you go into academia because you're so likely to be in a precarious short-term post and are facing imminent unemployment. You won't even get an interview for most of these, but nor will your peers, so at least you'll be in good company. Nevertheless, it can be very hard to take the constant rejection, and I remember literally sobbing down the phone to my mum back in 2019 after a particularly brutal week in which I got rejected four times, two of them in a 24-hour period. In that way, I often think academia is like acting, where people go to many, many auditions, but usually get told they didn't get the job. It can be really crushing. 
The best thing that I can say about the UK job application process is that interviews are at least all done on one day. I understand that in the States they can be spread over several days, which is absolutely grueling and I don't know how you're meant to attend them if you have a full-time job as well, let alone kids. You generally hear back within 48 hours at most as well, in fact the phone call frequently comes on the same day, whereas I know for other jobs you can be waiting months. Why are so many contracts only nine or ten months though? Well, that's because universities often ditch these employees at the start of the summer once teaching and marking is done and when no one is hiring so that they don't have to pay you for June, July and August. They can then hire someone new for the beginning of the next academic year and start them at the bottom of the pay spine again because if you're there for more than a year, your salary will most likely go up. You'll therefore be struggling to live on as little as nine months pay, likely crippled by high rents in some town or city you'd never want it to live in, hundreds of miles from home, family and friends, and trying to squeeze in research time in the summer as well. It can be a very tough life and I don't miss that aspect of it. The other thing you'll need to find time to do, as well as all your teaching, trying to research and publish, filling out job and funding applications, presenting at conferences and maintaining a social media presence, because you'll have to network of course, that's one of academia's favourite buzzwords, and occasionally sleeping, is additional career development. In the UK, one of the things you should be aiming to get is some sort of teaching recognition. One of the most popular is from the Higher Education Academy. This comes in four ranks, which are Associate Fellow of the HEA, Fellow, Senior Fellow and Principal Fellow. I myself have Fellowship, which came through soon after my lecturing post had finished in 2020, though I submitted the application beforehand. But as I ended up leaving academia, to be honest, it now seems like a total waste of many weeks worth of work and £200 which I had to fork out myself. Now, I never got past lecturer status because COVID happened. This effectively ended my academic career as virtually no one was hiring for the autumn 2020 semester when my contract finished and by the next year I was a YouTuber. Having not published or taught since 2020 to 21, it's now too late to get back into the rat race. Had I been able to stay though, a successful career path might have looked something like this. Short term lecturing post leading to a permanent lecturing post during which I would hopefully have been able to teach on a module of my own creation and based on my own interests, leading to a senior lecturing post, leading to a professorship, some universities have an associate professor level too, leading to retirement. Hardly anyone nowadays though who gets a PhD is able to follow this path because the university job market is so broken with too many people seeking not enough posts and few of them being permanent. I should say, of course, that I'm talking about the humanities because that's what I worked in. It could very well be different in other fields. I'm also certain that there are lots of other issues to contend with the further up the ladder you go, but as I didn't have the chance to get there, I can't comment on those. I know I've painted a picture of doom and gloom here, but there is a lot to be said for academia too. I really miss the collegial atmosphere of it, as I now work alone. Teaching can be great fun, working with many of the students is very rewarding, and of course getting to do your own in-depth research is the best bit of all. If you can get a job, the starting salaries are good, at this point in time they're usually in the 30,000s, but again see jobs.ac.uk for up-to-date examples. And these good salaries are a relief as you're going to be in your late 20s at best before you begin. Prior to the crazy inflation rates we're currently seeing in the UK, I also thought the annual increases were good too, at about £1,000 a year, and you have paid annual maternity and sick leave, as well as unions and HR departments to protect your rights and complain to if something goes wrong. These benefits are not to be sniffed at. I don't have any of them anymore as a self-employed person, and I miss them. The pension system is admittedly in quite a state at the moment and it's been causing a lot of strike action, but I don't have room to get into that now. And heck, at least they have a pension system. Let me finish by telling you this. If I could get a well-paid lecturing job in Northern Ireland or the Republic, which allowed me to work in my own field of interest, I would go back to academia tomorrow. That might seem crazy given all the problems I've listed, but remember, I've already done a lot of the heavy lifting. I have the PhD and the teaching experience and qualification and I wanted to work in academia and was only forced out by a worldwide pandemic. If you understand what you're getting into and are prepared to do it, academia can still be very rewarding, if only you can get a job. 
Plus, when I told people I was a researcher or a lecturer, it was a lot easier for them to process. When I tell them I'm a YouTuber or a content creator, I usually have to explain what that means and they look at me like, is that a real job? And sometimes flat out ask me how much money I make, which is pretty rude. You also get a lot of people who think that because they watch YouTube, they know how to be a YouTuber and they try to tell me how to do my job, which is like me saying, I just watched Wimbledon, now I'm a professional tennis player. That sort of thing didn't happen when I worked in academia. Anyways, gang, that's what it takes to become a professional historian and also to pursue a career in the UK university sector. I hope this has been illuminating for you. Before you go, please remember to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel, and you can also find me on Instagram and Patreon, where I provide bonus material including mini podcasts and early access to ad-free videos. These are both linked in the description box below for you. Thank you to everyone who already supports me on Patreon, and to those of you who make one-off donations to the channel using the thanks button underneath videos. If you work in academia, please share your experiences of doing so in the comments below, and if not, let me know how long it takes to train up to do your job, or what the education system in your part of the world is like, as I'm always fascinated to hear about other countries and industries and how they operate. Until next time everyone, keep learning.